The 1960s was a decade of individualism, and few individuals from this era are as iconic as Bob Dylan and John F. Kennedy. For Dylan, the 60s was just the beginning of a half-century career that has included over 2,500 shows, 38 studio albums, 13 Grammys, and the 2016 Nobel Prize in Literature. Kennedy, on the other hand, like so many of the decade's giants, was taken from us too soon, leaving us to wonder what he may have accomplished if not for his tragic assassination in 1963. Today on The Road to Now, we talk about the life, times, and influence of Bob Dylan and John F. Kennedy with award-winning historian Dr. Douglas Brinkley. Today's Ramsey Records Album of the Week is Samantha Crane's You Had Me a Goodbye. Drawing on inspiration from her origins as an Oklahoman and member of the Choctaw Nation, Crane's third collaboration with producer John Vanderslice is an all-analog album, so you can buy a vinyl copy knowing that no computers were harmed in the process. The album features beautifully written songs such as Red Sky, Blue Mountain, which Crane sings in the Choctaw language. To pick up your copy of Samantha Crane's You Had Me at Goodbye, please visit RamserRecords.com today. I'm Bob Crawford. And I'm Ben Sawyer, and this is The Road to Now. Today's guest, Douglas Brinkley, who is currently working on a book about uh, Bob Dylan. The most prolific historian of our generation. He's a presidential historian. He's also done scholarship with regards to Hunter S. Thompson, Jack Kerouac, uh, of course, you, you mentioned Bob Dylan, not only presidential history, but American pop culture. And this is something I'm very interested in. History and culture inform one another. And that's what makes Douglas Brinkley's work so unique and so important for us. Absolutely. And we had a great conversation with him. He's been spending time with Bob Dylan. He's writing this book. He's also working on a project to commemorate the 100th birthday of John F. Kennedy. And we were able to speak with him about so many things. And this is what's great about someone who has dug this deeply into our history, but also given a lot of appreciation to culture, is that he's so versatile. We talked to him about so many different things. And so many of these episodes, it's like we interview him for 30 minutes and then we're like, oh, but and I, I feel like we could have talked to this guy for, I mean, four days. Yeah, there's something about uh, Douglas Brinkley that makes you want to be sitting around a campfire, you know, outside somewhere with a beer and uh, listening to, to music, you know, we, we referenced a lot of uh, great Bob Dylan albums and songs, and I would love to listen to them with him, uh, and that would be great. And you, uh, as you mentioned, we, we not only speak about Bob Dylan, we also spoke with Douglas Brinkley about John F. Kennedy, and he, he's got a book coming out on May 2nd. It's called J JFK, A Vision for America, and that was uh, co-authored with uh, Stephen Kennedy Smith. And I think what was amazing, we were able to tie this together because JFK is such an interesting character. And for me, for a long time, uh, I've always kind of puzzled at how Americans remember him so positively when there were so many questionable things that happened during his administration. But as we talked about uh, the reasons for Kennedy becoming memorialized in the way that he is, we spoke about how him as an individual reflects the greater individualism growing in American society in the 1960s. And uh, I really look forward for uh, you guys listening to this and, and uh, enjoying it as much as we enjoyed having the conversation. Doug Brinkley, welcome to The Road to Now. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You're working on a book about Bob Dylan. Yeah, I did uh, an interview of Bob Dylan for Rolling Stone, a cover story, a few years back. And uh, that started uh, leading to me getting uh, more and more involved with Team Dylan. And uh, I'm now working on a book that's going to mainly deal with the Rolling Thunder Review era or more specifically, a group of uh, mid-'70 albums. Dylan did uh, Planet Waves with the band, um, uh, Blood on the Tracks, Desire, and Street Legal. What an amazing period of Dylan's career. It's kind of one of my favorites. What I love about that period, he took his, at the time, standards, that Rolling Thunder Review Tour, he took his, his, his catalog and reinterpreted it on the road. And this is something Dylan does all the time. He's still doing it, right? Well, exactly. I mean, a big shift was, you know, he got out of Woodstock, New York, and uh, ended up moving to Malibu. And there became a lot of uh, offers for him to do a big tour in 1974 uh, with Bill Graham and, and the likes. 
And so we stepped up and did it. Um, it was the Dylan and the band tour. It went all over. A double album came out of it. And it was an unbelievable moment. It was the biggest rock concert uh, money-wise in, in history. But uh, I've looked at Dylan's diaries from that trip um, of 74. And, uh, you know, he, he had high moments, great times in some cities. But he was... Uh, feeling like he he wanted to do something uh, different his next tour and of course he ended up you know i've seen these little notebooks that he kept and he'd write very small all of these different verses uh to songs um that became blood on the tracks for example tangled up in blue was originally called uh, dusty sweatbox blue Wow. So instead of when you go, you know, um, Tangled Up in Blue, it would have been Dusty Sweatbox Blues. Uh, and you can see all the different changes in his archive, you know, when you go through these notebooks. He recently has sold all of his papers, diaries, uh, tapes, etc., cetera, um, his collection um, to the um, Tulsa, University of Tulsa in Oklahoma. And so it's um, the same place Woody Guthrie's material is at. And I found Woody Guthrie's long-lost novel a few years back and brought it out with Johnny Depp. Uh, the novel's called House of Earth. Was that the novel that he was writing when he was young? Well, the first big book Woody Guthrie wrote was Bound for Glory, but he was working on this novel about the Dust Bowl um, because he was thought the national media kept dealing with the big, giant, black dust clouds that would you know, uh, rampage, you know, through the Great Plains in the Southwest during the historic drought. But the real problem was when you ha had cut all the trees and overplowed up areas was in the winter when instead of um, dust blowing, it would be blizzards. And he was there in Pomp Up, Texas, when this snow blizzard came and people froze, the livestock died. And so he wrote a book about House of Earth uh, which was really thinking that the, all of these wooden structures, all the trees in the central part of our country had been cut, and he thought people needed to live adobe style, the way the Native Americans in the Southwest did. So he built an adobe house, and this novel's about all of that. And it's really a love story uh, between two um, characters stuck during the Dust Bowl years on the Great Plains. I listened to an, an interview you did with Lance Armstrong last year, or early this year, and uh, you talked about Dylan not being as reclusive as we think. We kind of imagine Dylan, and he's this hermit genius, but you said he, he's pretty social. Oh, he's a wonderful person, and he's, um, he's kind of a mensch in his own way. It's just... He does things on his own time clock and, uh, you know, talks when he feels like talking sort of thing. But the real person, uh, you know, he's a father with many children, a lot of grandchildren. He's got multiple responsibilities, but he really enjoys traveling um, everywhere. He loves performing, but he, he's deeply involved with historic sites, and he doesn't just, like, dial in cities. If he goes somewhere, he'll go visit a museum or a historic house uh, I've talked to him about a number of the places he's gone like that, and he does it regularly. So it's like um, a, um, when he tours the world, it's not just about the concert. He gets to see things. Uh, he has a, a mind, in my view, obviously, that's all about music and poetry, but also deep interest in topography, landscape, uh, and, um, and history. And, you know, so he l likes to walk around and look at things and goes to art museums and uh, – and historic homes in the bid, and, and I've ended up talking to him, um, and, you know, when he feels like it at random places, uh, once at Saratoga, um, New York, uh, in a state park, he just was there with uh, his bus, he, nobody even knew he was around, and just had chairs and a nice tree grove, and got to talk to him a little bit about history and things like Native American culture, which he's very interested in, and he couldn't be nicer. I think the problem is everybody wants his time, and, uh, and uh, you know, he, he has to be careful to only do a little bit of that kind of socializing. I couldn't imagine being Bob Dylan. You really um, have to be strong in your mind and have a lot of mental fortitude to put aside what everyone is always saying about you or, or how revered you are, that... That is not a human, you know, that's not how any of us live our lives with that, with that self-image. 
Well, exactly. And, you know, he reminds me a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, they just do things their way. Um, and, you know, if you, do, if you don't like the program, get out of the way. I mean, people like uh, Amer- authentic American geniuses like Wright and Dylan, um, you know, just kind of have this really deep individualistic strand in them. I mean, I think in Dylan's case, growing up way north of Minnesota, I mean, uh, uh, listeners should go up there to Hibbing in the Masabi Range on the Canadian border that far north and then beam yourself back to the 1940s up there. Um, it was deeply isolated and it'd be below zero in the winter. And Bob used to say, you know, you almost have a hallucination just looking out the window when it's below zero and the snow's blowing. And all he would get in would be some radio stations playing music of the era and, um, and the trains coming in and out of town that spoke of a larger world, but he formed, you kind of create your own kind of insular fortitude. His father, who he talked, willingly talks about these days, uh, you know, his dad had to work in a um, copper mine up there in the middle of that kind of condition um, to try to get his kids uh, a better life here in America. And so there, there's a hardiness and an individual, you know, toughness to, um, Dylan's mind, but also his being, you know, he, he, it's grueling traveling the way he does all over the world, but he, he comports himself and uh, makes sure he expends his energy in the correct ways. One of the things that amazes me about Bob Dylan, and I guess there's the parallels with Frank Lloyd Wright too, uh, to a certain degree, uh, is the unwillingness or, or perhaps the somehow being impervious to, uh, to being a has-been. Right. I mean, you think about Dylan, you think about the 60s a lot of times, but the man's still making music. He's still a legend. He never got, you know, thrown into that dustbin of, you know, of of somebody who's like, ah, they were, you you know, they were something once. Uh, It's always like Dylan still has that mystique. How how do you explain that? How is it that, that Bob Dylan has spanned, you know, half a century, really? and still maintains this legendary status on, on the basis of what he's doing now. Well, he has that line in a song, Mississippi, uh, which is, you know, you can always come, um, you know, you can always come back, but you can't come back all the way. And I think once he re- recognized in the 60s mm-hmm. that kind of superstardom where, you know, people were flocking and following you and paparazzi, and uh, he purposely kind of went in retreat from that because it was a, a road that you wouldn't survive. I mean, people like Jimmy, friends of his like Jimi Hendrix or Janis Joplin, and, and we all can do a laundry list of people that perished uh, due to, to the speedy essence of the 1960s. So he really wanted to be a, um, he had a really wonderful mother and father, and he really decided once he had children that he wanted to be a great dad and needed to protect them. And that became um his cushion. And then of course, when his marriage fell apart, he, he had that born again, Christian period where he did uh, slow train and shot of love and saved um, and in it musically, but it was helping him kind of uh, get his balance in a, in a culture that eats celebrities up alive. Once he found his balance, it took him a, a little bit. Now he's really a, um, knows what he wants, and that's to have a band with the players that he likes, the, uh, try to cut out some of the middle people. He's created kind of the best people work for Bob. I mean, uh, Jeff Rosen out of New York and Larry Jenkins out of Los Angeles, who kind of um, are point people for all that he does. These are some of the nicest people I've ever met. So he's decided I can do things, but I've got to um, – you know, keep keep um, positive people around me and build my own uh, my own little battalion, if you'd like. And I think once he got some infrastructure, uh, he was able to keep doing what he wanted to do. And he, he has a great ability to turn out um, noise. I mean, once he said to me, you know, because he we were talking for such a while, and I over thanked him for giving me that kind of time. He said, "Well, you're not a newsy person. You're talking about history. I know something about history." Um, he then went on to say, I'm a historian, which is like a trade, like being an electrician or a plumber or a craftsperson, and that, that's a wonderful thing. But what he didn't like is, the, uh, is this constant news cycle of you know, breaking news and, and all that's uh, all bogus and uh, ends up just um, creating falsehood in the end. I guess the, he was on to that fake news idea a long time ago. 
Dylan's always been ahead of us. You, you, you mentioned his band, and I guess I have to say, I've had a, the pleasure and honor to work with Donnie Heron, who plays uh, fiddle and pedal steel for, for Dylan, and what a great guy. Um, he's, he's recorded on some Avett Brothers albums that we've done, and, and I just want to say, like, you're not kidding that he has surrounded himself with the absolute best musicians possible. Uh, on that new triple CD they brought out, Triplicate, uh, uh, you know, people are commenting on Dylan's singing of standards, but listen to the band on that. I mean, the arrangements of those old standards are just flawlessly um, done. Um, it, it's really quite a, and you know, I think from traveling so much with Bob, they've gotten tighter and tighter and tighter. So uh, they're really one of the the best, uh, maybe the best, uh, um, you know, touring band going on now they're able to do so many different things at at um at the snap of a finger you mentioned briefly the dylan's what we we call christian period but i i don't think you know i i look at dylan's uh discography as one big tapestry i don't say he had a christian period and he had a this and i feel like it all kind of bleeds through but those albums came, like you said, right on the heel of the Desire, uh, Street Legal, you know, all that, that time period. And then I really feel like those are his most underrated albums. Saved, Shot of Love, Slow Train, which maybe is my favorite album of his. Um, talk about that period. Well, it's a, um, I agree with you completely, everything you said. Um, the, I think those are probably, in my mind, his most under underappreciated period i saw him back then when he did it his live shows were off the charts great but uh but the fact that he wouldn't do some of the the you know like a rolling stone or blowing in the wind this left some audience members um distraught um but they were really great live shows and i think when when the bootleg series that dylan does starts bringing out some of his recordings at muscle shoals from slow train and the shot of love sessions um you're going to really find more and more great music there but uh, you know the comment you made that so perceptive i i don't re- i mean we we kind of you know it's like picasso's blue period and all of this i mean we people do it just to get a handle on things but the i've noticed from doing this kind of intensive study of dylan that this spiritual world religion if you'd like questioning of a philosophical questioning of existence pondering the creator uh, looking and dabbling in the Old and New Testament, that's been with Dylan forever. It just became more pronounced in some of the um, songs, on, particularly on Saved. And, uh, you know, but he, he, it, it's not as stark as perhaps people think. It's all part of uh, who he is. He just loved gospel music. Um, he was at that point having a, um, having a re- reflecting on the life of Christ quite a bit. And then he poured that out. Remember, Johnny Cash was obviously doing that with uh, a lot of Christian albums, too. And, uh, and so Dylan went there and went deep into our gospel music and, uh, and came up with some just great songs and, 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 and some of my favorites. I find uh, Shot of Love to be a very underappreciated CD. Oh, I'll tell you, my, my, when I was in college, me and my friends, we loved, we just embraced that album, as, as people do at different times in their life. But we would play that album every single day. Uh, here's a question I, I've always wanted to ask you. You've written a lot about Hunter S. Thompson, Jack Kerouac, Ken Kesey. Now you're writing about Dylan. These are all these counterculture figures, you know, kind of from the, I would, if you want to put Kerouac in the 60s, or at least being an, an influencer of the 60s, we can. Uh, Hunter Thompson just a little bit later that counterculture generation now they're I guess you know they're in their 60s and 70s we've elected Donald Trump president what is it in the with that that generation of the 60s and then what's playing out in American politics today is there a connection well that counterculture generation is um, Jack Nicholson jokes they're the new old um, you know, Nicholson being 80 years old now, um, a lot of these people we, you know, associate with Easy Rider and all of that are, if, if they're still survived, are, are senior. Um, but they accomplished a lot in the 60s. What we call them the long 60s, say John F. Kennedy's election in 1960, all the way to Nixon being 
thrown out of office over Watergate in 74. That long 60s gave us civil rights and voting rights, um, you know, uh, Selma and the rest. It gave us Native American rights through fierce fights at places like Alcatraz and Wounded Knee. Um, it gave us women's movement and equality, but uh, environmentalism, I mean, I'm writing right now about how John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson saved all these national seashores and lake shores and wild and scenic rivers, and the EPA got created in 1970. So it was an incredible progressive run. But since Ronald Reagan in 1980, there's been a backlash, and the country has become uh, right center when in the 60s it was center left and um, there's consequences to that you're starting to see programs of that era being gutted or challenged in the courts and uh, it has to be discouraging i know it is to a lot of activists from the 60s to um, thought they changed the world forever only to be spending their twilight years in the age of donald trump but i would reassure that generation and the elders that are still around that they did great work and a lot of it endures and in in ways that we can't always um discern because it's many of many of the things they fought for have become part of the american fabric that won't be able to be gutted that easily agreed jefferson cowie uh in his new book on the great depression has pointed out that uh the 60s in itself the, the movements there they differ from the old left movements in that they're more about individual rights, the, the, the 60s movements, about the individual rights and not about collective rights. I think it's quite a brilliant argument. This, these musicians, though, they, and, and the figures Bob just talked about, they all embody this notion of the individual. Do you see that being, uh, uh, do you agree with that? Do you see this when you look at music and the way it's affected our culture? Do you see the rise of the individual as, uh, as, as changing us in that era? Well, you know, I'll, I, I got to know Chuck Berry pretty well, and, and um, I just wrote the liner notes for Berry's last album called Chuck. He asked me to write them, be, um, you know, last year when they decided to bring this thing out with uh, Dual Tone Records out of Nashville. It'll be out in June. But um, Berry was such, he's like a blowtorch of fierce individuality. And imagine standing up in the 1950s saying, move over Tchaikovsky, you know, and move over white classical music, rock and roll is here. And how harassed Barry got by police wherever he went. Um, not, and I'm just choosing him. I, there are um, 50 African-American artists that we could talk about. But um, he, um, he persevered just through this sort of um, tenacious individuality that I'm going to do what I want to do. Um, you know, Elvis Presley famously said, um, I'm just doing what I feel like doing. Well, when you do, do I, what you feel like doing, that often has um, revolutionary connotations. So the birth of rock and roll through Barry and Presley and beyond, I mean, really kind of allowed people to um, feel free and opened up. Um, it killed a lot of cobwebs and made people, you know, Elvis used to, basically say every night could be Saturday night because in the South Monday through Friday, you had to work a nine to five job and Sunday was the Sabbath and Saturday nights, you'd go out and party and go to the bar, listen to music, dance. And, and that generation said every night can be Saturday night, meaning find personal freedom, have fun, make Monday fun, Tuesday fun, Wednesday fun. And it wasn't always like that. So even when we enjoy our leisure time, today. Uh, I think we got to remember that generation pioneered a lot in breaking down the Puritan and Calvinist evangelical traditions to kind of open up uh, what constituted a good time and what didn't. So you've talked about writing a book about Johnson and Kennedy. You've talked about doing the liner notes for Chuck Berry's album. You, my friend, are writing all the time. You are the most prolific historian of our time. I don't hesitate even to say that. You've got a book coming out on May 2nd called JFK, A Vision for America. Can you tell us about that? Well, the Kennedy family tapped me to just help them with their 100th birthday. John F. Kennedy, this May 29th, would have been 100 years old. And um, there, we got involved with this project, Maureen Dow, the columnist, and Skip Gates, ahead of the Du Bois School at Harvard, and um, Gloria Steinem and um, who's who of people uh, from you know John McCain and Jimmy Carter I could go on and on to try to um, 
celebrate but honor, reflect on JFK's 100th birthday. So we're doing a big show at the Smithsonian Institute, doing a big uh, Profiles and Courage event at the Kennedy Library in Boston. And it's just a chance to look at Kennedy's life and particularly those 1,000 days when he said we're going to put a man to the moon at the end of the decade, and we did, when they pushed forward for a wilderness bill to have pristine landscape and where the civil rights movement took hold and the Peace Corps was created and um, special forces, our U.S. SEALs and um, Green Beret grew out of the Kennedy years um, and also nuclear test ban treaty. We used to just blow willy-nilly up in the air, detonate nuclear weapons um, in Nevada and the Marshall Islands and Alaska, other places. And uh, Kennedy was trying to stop and was successfully got Soviet Union and Britain and others to stop atmospheric testing. So there's a lot that went on in that early 60s, and we're hoping that to use Kennedy's birthday in this book that I did with Stephen Kennedy Smith, John F. Kennedy's nephew, um, to you know shed some light on that era. I, this is interesting to me because I you know I'm, I'm I teach history as well at the university level, and the 20th century uh, is is my you know my my deepest interest. And for me, Kennedy has always amazed me and that people tend to remember him very fondly. Most people, you know, if you ask somebody who remembers Kennedy, they're like, oh, it's the hope. To me, though, I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that he was only president for a short period of time. Because, you know, as, as someone who focuses on the Cold War, uh, what I see a lot is, you know, when I think of Kennedy, I think of the Bay of Pigs. I think of... Uh, his questionable handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis would, you know, he could have basically stayed silent. Most uh, most intelligence reports uh, that, that we've learned about since then suggested we knew what Khrushchev wanted, and we could have settled that with uh, with much less alarm. So, do you think that? How much do you think this hope, you know, the, the unfulfilled hope, plays into remembering him primarily fondly? Oh well, certainly. I mean, the big thing is, you know, he was murdered in Dallas, and it's a the, the national who done it and he was so handsome and there he was with his brains blown out and the brains went in his wife's lap her pink chanel suit and walter cronkite having to you know get on television and tell us all about it like who killed kennedy who is lee harvey oswald who's jack ruby where's kennedy's body did lyndon johnson get sworn in did the russians have a role in this on and on and on it was such a traumatic moment only Pearl Harbor and 9-11 are in that same kind of league of just shocking the national system and to such a degree. And um, I think as years gone on, there are no photos of Kennedy getting older. I mean, we see Richard Nixon in retirement uh, and, you know, um, in, in Lyndon Johnson, you know, kind of grew his hair long and rolled his own cigarettes down in the Texas Hill Country. And Kennedy was gunned down in his gallant Crime. And there was always a promise about JFK and, you know, the promise of, of a different America. He was kind of a third wave going on of progressivism after Theodore Roosevelt's um, era and then FDR, of course, and it got stunted. And so there's a filled with a lot of what would have been um, and, you know, would he have gotten us fully into Vietnam the way Lyndon Johnson did, for example, um, but I think a lot of it, I see, you know, we live in an age where people like sound bites and television clips, uh, visuals, YouTube generation, and Kennedy holds up well with that, his press conferences, his speeches, um, his coy or, or wry remarks. Uh, so he's kind of a celebrity president, and it makes him, and he has a, a, a myth about him. I, I recently read a um, a beautiful letter. I, I actually, I recommend it to people. It's in the collected letters of John Steinbeck. He wrote a letter Steinbeck to Jackie Kennedy right after um, her husband's death, and Steinbeck was talking about what myth is. So he's dealing with King Arthur and others in history, but it's this brilliant piece that Steinbeck privately wrote to Jackie Kennedy, and it's now available in a book. Uh, the collected, you know, letters of Steinbeck. If somebody's um, in a library digging mode or Amazon buying mood, it's really worth checking this thing out. It was Steinbeck on why myth, why the Kennedy myth may be important for the country. 
I'll tell you, you talk about being in a library digging mode. I recommend everyone go listen to Doug Brinkley's uh, interview with Lance Armstrong in the Forward podcast. But you said that you learned how to speed read, and you told Lance that day you would re- you would probably read two books. I love to read. Te- can you teach me how to speed read? I mean, how do you learn how to do that, and how do you comprehend? Well, I, I, I need to preface that by saying I am technologically incompetent. Um, I'm anything that has to do with wires and uh, or or wireless, I'm terrible at. So, uh, but I do have a old-fashioned ability to uh, uh, speed read, and also um, I, I think it comes out of just reading so much. People always say, well, you're the most prolific writer, like you just said, a you know, historian. But for each book you write, you have to read, read, read in order to write that book. So I've developed a – I didn't take a class on it, but I've developed a, a skill. Uh, I remember when I was a child growing up, I, we, a public library would give little color balloons for – who would read the most books in the summer, and I filled mine up very quickly, and the librarian <laughs> questioned whether I really did it or not. I was very hurt. She thought I was making it up and just sticking the stickers on. But uh, So I guess that's a gift, um, but you know, I'm, I'm so inadequate in other things, but I can read quickly. Today, for example, just the last hour, I read the entire National Park Service report on a place called Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore outside of Chicago, uh, which got saved in 1966, and I was looking at the fight between development and uh, and, and how shabbily we treat Mid America. We haven't saved all of the uh, proper natural places and conservation. You know, everybody turned west and east and let the let the Midwest suffer. But this um, this Indiana sand dunes is a great resource that was protected in the 60s. So I just was reading all the that right when uh, we started our podcast. What do you call this post 9-11 period of American history? I mean, we talked about genres with Dylan and putting things in a in an understandable box. Can we are we at a point here now in 2017 where we can say that this is a period of history that has some coherence to it? Well, there's an old saying, I mean, the point of history is to remind us that our, our uh, present times are not uniquely oppressive, and a lot of people will feel um, oppressed right now, like what happened to America, but we'll get through whatever it is we're going through now. I don't know where the end result is uh, with this. It was a very fluke election for a bunch of reasons we all know in 2016, but I think you... you preface that also yourself by saying 9-11, and I do think that was the game changer. Uh, Hunter Thompson wrote a book called Kingdom of Fear uh, about right about that time, that America has become very afraid of its own shadow. Uh, there's a xenophobia, we're worried about our borders, we're worried about um, our future, we're worried about you know global extinction um, due to climate change. Everybody's kind of uh, worried and fearful. We kind of have a lot of anxiety going around. So uh, collectively, it's hard to know how to cure that individually. Go take a hike in the woods. Uh, go, go play with your family. Uh, go read a novel. Um, tr- you know, try to uh, find some uh, sanity in your life and some, in some, you know, at least in pockets, because you just can't live in crisis mode uh, all the time without short-circuiting. I might tell you, I'm a big fan of the Abbott Brothers. I listen all the time, and you guys have made music of great integrity, and I'm proud of um, um, what the band's been able to do, so count me in as one of your biggest fans. Well, thank you, and maybe we can, we'll see you in, in New Bronzefels uh, later this year. Well, be careful. I mean, I'll start bugging you guys for free backstage passes, <laughs> so you better not be too nice to me. Doug, anytime. Well, Doug, Thank you so much for your time. This has been uh, just great fun for me. Hey, good, good deal. I enjoyed it, and take care, guys. Thank you for joining us today on The Road to Now. Our program is produced by Bob Crawford, Ben Sawyer, and Ian Scotta. Edited by Bob Crawford and Ian Scotta. Paul DeFiglia provides our music. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and rate us on iTunes. For more information about this or any other episode, please visit theroadtonow.com. For Dr. Ben Sawyer, this is Bob Crawford. Take care. Mm-hmm.